What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the Rant and Review Pro Wrestling. I did take some days off because I was building a new computer, which this isn't a tech channel, but I have to say I'm quite impressed with myself. I actually built this thing, from, well, not from scratch, but I built this computer, which is a mega system mainly to handle being able to produce YouTube videos a lot faster. I haven't bought a new computer in years and years and years, so it was time for an upgrade, but in the time that I've been gone, all hell is broken loose. But let's start off right now with catching up on the G1 Climax 32 from New Japan Pro Wrestling. I will also have a video talking about the ongoing drama between Kenny Omega and Will Ospreay and my thoughts on Vince McMahon retiring. Hell is frozen over, in fact, indeed. And you can find those videos on my channel if you subscribe and hit the notification bell. But as for the G1, Knights 3, 4, and 5 saw a lot of of action um between the blocks there were some a lot of matches that were very very good and there was a, such a variety of matches and that's the one thing about these four blocks in the g1 this year you're getting just every show with them splitting it up i'm starting to see now the vision that they had when they did the four blocks you're getting like different stuff every single show which i think is a good thing in the end some of the feature matches that have gone on over the last three nights of the g1 zack saber jr continuing his dominance uh, in the C block going up another two points with his win over Aaron Hanare. We also had David Finley getting his first G1 match, but unfortunately for him, it was a loss to Yujiro Takahashi and the House of Torture with Show coming in and doing his usual shenanigans. But the House of Torture will be thwarted by one of their own or a cousin of their own, I guess. El Fantasma, who's not in the House of Torture, but he is in Bullet Club, took on Yujiro uh, the other night who's in Bullet Club and the House of Torture. It's very confusing. And before the match, it was El Fantasma saying how he was going to take Peter. So we know Fantasma is straight. And he, he, they were going to work out this agreement. And this has happened before. Yudro goes, okay, if you lie down and I get the pin, then you get to get Peter. And, of course, Fantasmo turned on Yudro, which led to a pretty decent match. In fact, it's one of El Fantasmo's best in-ring performances in the heavyweight division so far. And there were times, and I've said this before, there is a lot of El Fantasmo now that reminds me of Kenny Omega six years ago. And, in fact, there are moments in this match where I'm like, this really feels like I'm watching Kenny Omega from 2016 in New Japan. But uh, Fantasmo does get the win. He gets the win by... Capricely pulling, which, he, which is what he does. He pulls on from all these other wrestlers. So, Sho shows up to the ring with the wrench. The referee catches him. He tries to throw it to Yujiro. And then Phantasmo gets the wrench. It goes clunk. It throws it back to Yujiro and falls down. So, the referee thinks Yujiro hit him. So, that's an Eddie Guerrero spot. Which then led to the Johnny Cage direct punch in the nuts. Which, uh, I've, which many wrestlers have done. Then there was the super kick. Followed by the... The Thunder Kiss 97 or whatever they call this big splash. So essentially, El Fantasmo channeled Kenny Omega, Shawn Michaels, Eddie Guerrero, Edge, and Jimmy Superfly Snuka within 20 seconds to end this match, which he won over Yudro. And he does wind up with Peter in the end anyway. But let's look over at the A block. A couple of really interesting things happened in the A block. Again, that's the monster block. You had... Kazushiko Okada taking on Toriano. Now, they had been kind of doing the multi-man tag matches, this thing where they really weren't getting along, even though they're both members of Chaos. Uh, Yano kind of going back to the old Yano, a little bit more hardcore, but it wasn't enough to beat Okada. Okada did get the win over Yano, who immediately went back to being goofy, jokey. Oh, so sorry, I didn't mean, I don't know what came over me. Bad Luck Fale was doing a lot of that work on this past week, over the past couple of nights. He took on Lance Archer on the, the third night and won that match by count out, which was a bit surprising and shocking. Uh, Lance Archer did get to beat up on a young lion again, so all things are right in the world for Lance, uh, except for the fact that he lost the match. And then Jeff Cobb took on Battle of Fale on night five, and that was, a I'm telling you what, there's a bit of a shift going on in the world of wrestling right now, and I think what's going on in the G1 with these big men matches, they're a lot better than you would normally expect, and it's been this kind of anti-big man thing for the last uh, decade and a half or so in pro wrestling, and I think this is kind of coming back. The match with Cobb was very short, and the biggest thing that happened there was the feat of strength. Jeff Cobb actually hitting the tour of the islands on Bad Luck Fale. I mean, Fale, they say he's 350. That dude's probably close to 380, and he's tall and wide and massive, and Jeff Cobb 
the, the tour de islands, you have to hold the guy in a slam position and then change directions. There's no faking that. There's no folly jumping into it and getting the move over. There's no uh, momentum swing. That is pure strength by Cobb to be able to do that. He hit the tour de islands on Battle of Folly and got the win. Probably hurt his back in the process, but my God, Jeff Cobb is a freaking agent. I'd be remiss not to talk about, I can't believe this, but Yoshi, yes, Yoshihashi. Yoshihashi's match for Shingo Takagi was absolutely fantastic. It is the best match I've seen of Yoshihashi. And look, I clown Yoshihashi all the time. I've been clowning him since I've been doing New Japan reviews on YouTube. But this guy absolutely turned it out. The crowd was behind him on this night, and he almost got the win over Shingo Takagi. But Shingo did pick up the win. Uh, barely picked up the win in a fantastic match. I usually would not, I can't believe I'm saying this. I wouldn't go out to say to watch a Yoshihashi match, but if you haven't seen this match, you have to see this match. It's a really, really good match. It's a really, really good match for Yoshihashi. I definitely recommend it. Now over in the B block, Jay White's basically holding court over there and it really came down to him and Tomohiro Ishii in the main event on the other night. And... Ishii has been a guy that's had Jay White's number for quite some time. In fact, coming into this match, I think he's three wins over Jay White as opposed to one loss to Jay White. So this was probably the stiffest opponent Jay White was going to face in the B block. And I did think if he got over Tomohiro Ishii, Jay White's winning the B block. The sequences near the end of this match, the, the counter wrestling these guys did, and, the, and it wasn't high flying stuff. This was counter wrestling, catch as catch can. And the timing. And at one point, you know, you hear after like a 10 move sequence, you hear Jay White going, whoo, you know, because they pulled it off and it just looked perfect. Uh, Ishii was throwing some of Jay White's own moves at him. Jay White was trying to clown a little bit, but he couldn't because Ishii was beating the crap out of him. In the end of the day, it was the Blade Runner and a little help from Gato that got Jay White this rare win over Tomohiro Ishii, the Stone Pitbull. And then after the match, Jay White decided he was not going to cut a promo. He was just going to clap to mock the Japanese fans. This man literally just went. <laughs> like he's doing Morse code or something. And the whole thing is because if you don't know, if you're new to New Japan, uh, the Japanese over in Japan, they can't, still cannot vocalize at wrestling shows. This has been going on for over two years now. They can't cheer, they can't boo, they can't have anything, any vocal auditory noises coming out because of the pandemic. Uh, that will be slightly ending in September with a show at Cork and Hall where they're going to allow the fans to start cheering and booing again, but that's not till then. And Jay White has been very critical and mocking the Japanese audiences for this for a couple of months now. So this was just the latest wrinkle in Jay White being a total tool. The 2J show, as we call it. But the thing that I think a lot of people are really thinking about right now is Tetsuya Naito and in the C block. And Naito had two matches over the past couple of nights, one against Hiroki Goto and one against Hiroshi Tanahashi, and he lost both of them. Now, the story with Naito is that this is probably his last chance to get the big main event slot at Wrestle Kingdom the way he wanted it to. He's been there before. He's lost the main events. He, he Then he won a main event, but then that celebration was ruined by Kenta. The pandemic has kind of soured his championship reign when he was champion. So that's not what Naito wanted to go out with. Naito wants a proper win, a proper reign as IWGP champion with crowds being able to cheer. This is his last chance to do this by winning the G1, sort of. And it's not looking good so far. And yeah, while both matches with both Goto and Tanahashi were fantastic, and Naito did seem to be, you saw a little bit more of that old 2017-2018 Los Ingobernables Rudo kind of Naito, which we've been seeing a lot more of him doing that over the last couple of months. It still wasn't enough to win this match, and a lot of people are sour on it. I will say this, though. Knowing New Japan's booking style and Gato's booking style, it would not surprise me if this is, a, you know, kind of a misdirect. They've done this before. Naito loses the first two matches. You're like, oh my God, he's not going to win the tournament. And then he just goes on and wins out the rest of the matches. And in fact, the path for Naito to win right now would be for him to win out the rest of his matches, which includes a win over Zack Sabre Jr. to get to eight points. At that point, that's the best that he can do. He'd need help. He needs Zack to lose at least one other match, and he would need for Hiroki Goto and for Hiroshi Tanahashi not to get to eight points because they would win a tiebreaker against him. 
That is what Naito needs as of right now to be able to win the C block. And it's very possible because we've seen, like I said, we've seen this before. I would not be surprised if Hiroki Goto and Hiroshi, Ta Hiroshi Tanahashi, when they meet up later on in the G1, go to a time limit draw. But we're going to have to wait and see on that. The C block might be the most interesting block storyline-wise as far as it relates to the points and the drama over just now Naito being a sentimental favorite. Just wanting him to get to this point now. He is my sentimental favorite and probably the same for a lot of fans. So don't think he's out of these. He's counted out yet. I think there's a possibility this just all might be a misdirect. As far as the standings right now, it's really Will Ospreay again still holding court in the D block. Tama Tonga is the closest to Jay White in the B block because Jay's had two matches. Tama's only had one where he beat Chase Owens this past week to get two points. And he can still get into it as well. If he wins his next match, he'll be tied with Jay at the top of the B block. C block, we already talked about, is basically Zack Sabre Jr.'s right now with Goto, Tanahashi, and a few others trying to catch up with him. In the A block, the monster block, Okada is running away with it with four points. And the other guys kind of trading wins and losses. Uh, we still have yet to have the Great Okan, Evil, or Tom Lawler participate in the G1 yet. They have still yet to have their first matches. And I was kind of iffy about this new format of the four blocks having some guys show up on one night and having other guys not wrestle for like a week and a half until they get into the tournament but i think it's actually kind of interesting i, I kind of like the fact that there's some guys who've they've wrestled their first two matches and now they're going to take a back seat and these other guys are now going to kind of take over this week in a tournament as we see evil okan and tom lawler now get into the g1 with their matches so i want to know what you guys think about the tournament so far let your voice be heard in the comment box below and until next time i will see you guys here for more news rumors and reviews as we continue our coverage of the g1 climax 32 from new japan pro wrestling right here on the ransom review pro wrestling have a good day